Hello, welcome. You now know how to condition air to the right temperature and humidity. And in this lecture, we are going to look at how to transport air from the central air handling unit to the rooms and how to size the air ducts. But let's start first with the location of the air inlet, where the outdoor air is supplied to the air handling unit. Where should we position it? One, two, three or four? Well, one is at street level, so a lot of pollution by traffic will enter the building, which is threatening for the quality of the indoor climate. So that's really not a good idea. Position number two is better. It is at least at the less polluted side of the building. However, an inlet at street level is never recommended as it is more prone to being damaged, clogged or temporarily pol polluted, by instance, uh, if it is close to a place where people are used to smoke. So here too, it isn't such a good idea. The higher the air inlet, the less polluted the air will be, so it is always recommended to put it on the roof, preferably at the less polluted side, so better at place 4 than at place 3. And of course, you also need to consider the environment and account for pollution sources from other buildings, industrial sites and the wind direction. Then, when using a mechanical supply and exhaust system, take good care that there is little chance of a shortcut between the polluted exhaust air and the outdoor supply air. Such a configuration is not a good idea. This one is better. Consider again the main wind direction in your design. This one would be even much better, but there are also many other possibilities. Which solutions do we have to bring air from the air handling unit after it has been heated, cooled, humidified or dehumidified to the place where people are? You see in purple the AHU on the roof. Well, this is a quite typical layout. A main duct transports air from the air handling unit vertically to, to all stories. On each level, the air is transported in a duct along the corridor. From this duct, pipes bring the air further to its room. Note that the diameter of the main vertical air duct is large. It has to transport air from the complete building. The horizontal corridor ducts are much smaller. They need to transport only half of the quantity of air needed per floor. In my example, there are five stories, so the air flow rate is 10 times smaller. And finally, the ducts leading from the corridor duct to the rooms are even smaller. Of course, many other configurations are possible depending on the preferences of the designers and on the layout of the rooms. Anyhow, straight routing and short branches are always preferred as it simplifies the work of the architect and engineers, reduces noise nuisance and increases energy efficiency, as we will see later. How to size ducts? Next, of the volume flow rates of air to be transported, we need to account for the velocity of the air flows. The higher the velocity, the more noise and rustle will be produced by the air in the ducts and, as you may have learned in another course, noise is an important parameter of indoor environmental quality. Additionally, the higher the velocity, the higher the pressure losses. When the pressure losses are high, the power of the fan increases, causing more energy use. To limit noise nuisance, maximum allowable velocities are set, which depend on the function of the space in which the duct is mounted. For instance, a central air duct is generally placed in a circulation zone, like close to the shaft for lifts or stairs. In such a zone, it does not matter a lot if there is some noise, so a relatively high air velocity is allowed, up to 10 meters per second. 
In corridors close to working areas, the air velocity should be limited to no more than 3 meters per second, while the velocity in room ducts should be below 1 meter per second. The air velocity at the supply valve itself is generally even smaller, in such a way that air velocities in the room itself are kept around 0.1 meter per second, and in any case below 0.25 meter per second, to avoid draft. Standouts may vary per country and do not always account sufficiently for noise issues. Now that we know the maximum allowed velocity, we can determine the size of the ducts. Let's do that on the example of this five-story building occupied by 500 people, 100 people per floor, needing an amount of fresh air of 36 cubic meter per hour per person. You see on the left the calculation method that was studied in another presentation. Basically, the volume flow rate is the cross-sectional area times the velocity of air, which allows us to calculate very easily the cross-sectional area of the pipe. This surface area is of course P times R square, by which we can determine the radius of the pipe. Ok, let's look at the main duct. If we deliver 36 cubic meter per hour supply air per person, we need a total of 18,000 cubic meter air per hour, which is 5 cubic meter per second. So, with an air velocity of 10 meter per second, the main air duct, the vertical one, should have a cross-sectional area of 5 divided by 10 equals 0.5 square meter, which means a radius of 0.4 meter which is a diameter of 80 cm. Let's look now at the corridor ducts. There are five floors. Each floor needs 18,000 divided by 5 is 3,600 cubic meter per hour. This is divided in two zones, one part of the air goes left and the other one right. So we need only half per branch, which is 1,800 cubic meter per hour, which is 0.5 cubic meter per second. With an air velocity of 3 meter per second, this leads to a cross-sectional area of 0.17 square meter, corresponding to a radius of 0.23 meter, a diameter of 46 centimeter. Finally, the ducts to the rooms. If we assume that there are four branches at each side, at both sides of the corridor, eight branches per half floor, therefore, then each room duct should convey 1800 divided by 8 equals 225 cubic meter per hour, which is 0 0.0625 cubic meter per second. With a maximum air velocity of 1 meter per second, this leads to a cross-sectional area of 0 0.0625 square meter, corresponding to a radius of 14 centimeter, which is 28 centimeter diameter. So, it is not that complicated to find out the size of piping. On the picture left, you see an example of a main air shaft and a corridor branch of much smaller diameter. Of course, the size depends greatly from the quantity of air to be transported. Note that the main air shaft is located here in an open informal space in the building where noise is not too much of a problem. In the picture right, you see in another building the corridor supply duct and the much smaller ducts to the rooms. You also see on the right the return air duct that we are going to address later. Note also that the pipe does not need to be round. It may also be oval or rectangular. See, for instance, on the picture right. In the former example, we handled the size of pipes in a system where only hygienic air was supplied. In an all-air system, 
the pipes must be designed to also bring enough heat and cold to the rooms. Let's take again the same building as previously and imagine you have calculated the needed heating and cooling capacities, which are the maximum nominal loads during cold weather and during hot weather. You can learn how to do that in the course energy demand in buildings. Imagine the heating load is 600 kilowatt. At this maximum heating load, the air is heated in the air handling unit up to TAC is 22 degrees Celsius in our example. Outdoor air is at zero degrees Celsius. This is just an example. Q is MCP delta T, so the mass flow rate M is 600 divided by 1 times 22 is 27.3 kilogram per second. As the density rho is 1.2, the volume flow rate V is 22.7 cubic meter per second instead of the 5 cubic meter per second we had before, leading to a radius air of 0.85 meter. As in our example, the flow is 4.54 times higher than with only hygienic air, the radius becomes square root of 4.54 higher, which is 2.13 times higher in all calculations. In our case, this leads to a main air duct of 1.70 meter diameter, corridor ducts of 18 Oh, sorry, of 98 centimeters and room ducts of 60 centimeter diameter. This means something for the special design and the space the architect should reserve. If the pipes are also meant to transport cold air, you also need to check that the pipe sizing is large enough to transport the needed cold. You will then choose the highest diameter of both heating and cooling modes. This was all for the supply ducts. But when mechanical exhaust is applied, we also need return ducts, which have quite the same size as the supply ducts. So the total space needed is like on the picture. Additionally, sometimes separate pipes are used for cooled air and for heated air, doubling again the amount of pipes. Cold and warm air are then mixed at room level. However, from the special and financial point of view, this is not very efficient. In this lecture, you have learned where to place the outdoor air supply to the air handling units. You are also aware that when designing the routing of, of air pipes, it should be as straight and short as possible. As for the sizing of air ducts, it is of main importance to minimize the air velocity to avoid noise nuisance and you have learned which formulas to use to size the ducts based on the needed volume flow rates. When all air systems are applied, higher volume flow rates are needed to transport heat and cold, so generally the pipes are much larger than when only hygienic air is transported. Finally, don't forget the return pipes and be aware of the consequences of your design for the architect. That's something to discuss with her or him. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.